twice during the 18th century, a world war culminated in a far-reaching peace treaty signed in Paris. The first of these, in 1763, confirmed Britain's seizure of Canada from the French. Now the Union Jack flew triumphantly from Quebec to Florida. But only 20 years later, Britain had to sign the humiliating Treaty of Paris, which ended the American Revolution. She had lost the greater part of her holdings in North America, for the victory of 1763 had given her more than she had the wit to handle. Now the 13 colonies along the Atlantic seaboard were independent. But their victory was incomplete, for Canada remained in British hands. It had survived both an attack from the south and a good deal of propaganda. The French Canadians, although cool toward Britain, had proved cooler still to the Protestant American invaders, and the English businessmen of Quebec had remained loyal to the crown. Their financial ties were with London, and their fur trading profits depended on Britain keeping the Americans out of the West. But there were friends of Britain in the 13 colonies too, almost one third of the population. As the revolution grew in fury, they had suffered insult, injury, and loss of property. Bitterness ran especially deep, for this war was not only a revolution, but also a civil war, with friend pitted against friend, so much so that more than one painting could show a British officer discovering that the revolutionary officer he was meeting under a flag of truce was a member of his own family. Each side in the war had reason for bitterness against the other. There was the burning of farms by British soldiers and looting while the American owners were away at war. Englishmen like Colonel Guy Johnson and his formidable Indian ally, Joseph Brandt, were even more hated by the Americans. Indian warriors friendly to the British were not discouraged from taking American scalps in ferocious raids in the backwoods of New York and Pennsylvania. These massacres of settlers would long be remembered by the revolutionaries. Loyalists, or Tories as the Americans called them, had reason for bitterness too, for they had been subjected to cruel and humiliating punishments. There were angry scenes when the Tories asked for the return of their confiscated property, and they were usually told to get out and stay out. Unwanted by the victors of the revolution, they became refugees in search of new homes. Many of the loyalists now headed for those parts of North America that were still firmly in British hands. They took advantage of ships provided by Britain to head for Nova Scotia, where almost 30,000 of them found homes, creating important and enduring settlements. The dispossessed loyalists had other destinations besides Nova Scotia, for Canada proper was also under British rule. So there was migration into the Great Lakes area and settlement along the St. Lawrence and Lakes Ontario and Erie. The old western wilderness, the preserve of the fur trade, was now dotted with the camps of new arrivals. There were wealthy men among them, but many were ordinary people who simply felt that the rights of Englishmen were more secure here than in the United States. Sites for farms were often distributed among loyalist settlers by drawing lots for the best locations in townships that had been surveyed by the provincial government. Then came the task of clearing the land. Many of the new settlers had never before used an ax, but they were soon at work cutting down the towering forest. The hardships were severe, 
but men and women who had lost everything could endure anything. Their determination and persistence meant permanent settlement, in contrast with the transient nature of the fur trade. New settlements added to the long-established French-speaking area in Quebec seemed to call for new political arrangements in British North America. One prominent loyalist, William Smith, called for a federation of these colonies. He argued that the American colonies would not have revolted if they had had a strong central government rather than unchecked local legislatures. But Britain's remaining holdings were far too scattered, and Smith got no support. For British officials like John Simcoe, Canada needed strong rule, but from London. Instead of being unified, the colonies should be further divided, and this took place under the Constitutional Act of 1791. Now there would be two Canadas, one mainly French-speaking and the other English, and each would have its legislative assembly with very limited powers, though for French Canada this meant the end of rule by council. In 1792, Lieutenant Governor John Simcoe presided at the opening of the first legislative assembly in Upper Canada. Here was a measure of representative government, but far from the wider democracy of the United States. For one thing, much power resided in the Upper House, modeled on the House of Lords. Here, wealthy landowners and merchants, as well as clergymen of the Anglican Church, exercised control. For men like Simcoe, power in the hands of the people was American and dangerous. So imperial authority, with all its trappings, remained paramount in Upper and Lower Canada. Although there was representative government, the system preserved Toryism, enabling potential monopolists and authoritarians to flourish. Meanwhile, the English merchants of Montreal were obsessed with other problems. For they were dismayed by the boundaries created by the peace treaty. Formerly, the Ohio-Mississippi Triangle had been British, and this was where the voyageurs had plied the rivers in search of furs. As British territory, this region had been indispensable to the fur trade, but now it had been sacrificed in the game of British power politics. Bitter at their loss, the Montreal merchants searched desperately for ways to overcome the handicaps imposed by American rule in the West, for ways to maintain the unity of the fur empire. Britain had an answer to the indignant complaints of the Montreal merchants. London pointed out that in giving the West to the Americans, it hadn't forgotten Canadian interests. What mattered was not the ownership of the territory, but access to it. And Britain promised that this access would be assured to the fur traders through a future commercial agreement with the Americans. But this treaty was not forthcoming, because powerful British mercantile interests at home were not prepared to grant the Americans reciprocal free trade privileges. Moreover, American cooperation was unlikely. Even more troubling were strong pressures within the United States to settle the newly won interior territories. This settlement in itself was enough to threaten the very existence of the fur trade. Frontiersmen who had helped with the American Revolution were eager to follow their tough leaders into the promised land of the interior. Key passes through the mountains had been discovered years before, and men like Daniel Boone had blazed trails for the settlers. Clearing the forest was the first task of the settlers, as they came in their thousands to the region west of the Appalachians. And they were watched by fearful Indians, who saw an end to hunting and a way of life. The Indians took their worries to the fur traders, 
and to the British authorities charged with protecting the trader's interests. At the same time, the British were intrigued by troubles in the United States, of discontent within the American army because of lack of funds to pay the troops. And American tax collectors were being tarred and feathered by citizens reluctant to pay for federal government. In Congress itself, there was disunity and occasional brawling, patterns of violence well remembered by loyalists in Canada who had seen plenty of tar and feathers during the revolution. And there was news too of American defeats in battles with the Indians in the Ohio country. For the British, these signs of American weakness lent weight to the argument that London had been unnecessarily generous in yielding the West to the United States. With stiffened resolve, Britain found excuses to delay the evacuation of its Western forts, as promised in the treaty. These might be used to bargain for concessions to the fur trade, and the British revived the old idea of an Indian buffer state between Canada and the U.S., with access for all. Friendship with the Indians was now being cultivated by British officials in Canada, like John Simcoe, who valued Indian hostility toward the U.S. The governor of Canada, Lord Dorchester, went dangerously far in promising the Indians help if they went on the warpath against the United States. The Indian threat again loomed large with this British encouragement. As the Americans saw him, this was the hunter of settler scalps, bolstered by the intrigues of Canadian fur traders. The Yankees surveyed the scene with dismay, bitter that the British, 10 years after the treaty, were still talking of a buffer state and were still occupying their forts in territory that was surely American. It wasn't only the fur trade that was changing Britain's attitude toward the West. In signing the peace treaty, Britain had in effect surrendered to American sovereignty lands that earlier treaties had recognized as Indian. Despite British arguments that these treaties, which the Americans refused to honor, involved only British rights and not Indian ownership, the Indians felt betrayed. The British, now realizing the way the Indians felt, were worried about becoming the target of Indian anger. They needed Indian friendship in the event of an American attack on Canada. Hence, Britain could not avoid placating the tribes, which further irritated the United States. Tension was rising. But meanwhile, events were being overshadowed by drastic developments overseas. In Paris, on the 14th of July, 1789, the Bastille fell before the fury of the mob. The French Revolution had erupted, and its ideas would be brought to America by a man called Edmond Genet. Genet was the new French Republic's first ambassador to the United States. But his welcome by George Washington was a cautious one, for Genet was seeking active aid for the French Revolution. He was seen by many as disrupting the neutral course of the American chariot of state. His insolent tactics eventually turned even friendly Americans against him. But Genet had another target, Quebec. For Quebec, citizen Genet wrote a flood of manifestos urging the French Canadians to throw off the chains of British rule and rejoin Mother France. But Quebec, although it showed some interest in the French Revolution's ideas, preferred the quiet and measured pace of life that it had developed for itself. It preferred the orderly minuet of a rustic province to the frenzied Saturnalia of Paris with its confused cries of liberty and equality. Above all, there was repugnance for the revolution's hostility toward the Catholic Church. And so, from the pulpits of Quebec's churches, there were sermons denouncing citizen Genet's mission and pastoral letters attacking the revolutionary enemies of the church. So strong were the feelings of the French-Canadian authorities 
that Admiral Nelson was honored by them when he defeated the forces of France. Britain's victories at sea were marked by celebrations and requiem masses. With Quebec under the Union Jack, the French Canadians felt there would be a better chance than under the Tricolor to eventually gain political power for themselves in Lower Canada. A few years earlier, on the faraway Pacific coast, another factor had emerged to influence Britain's posture in North America. For some time, British sea captains had established a base for trade and exploration on Vancouver Island. But Spain was quick to assert its claim to this whole region, and there were violent incidents. The threat of war mounted, and Britain had cause to wonder whether this ugly situation would be exploited by the Americans. As it happened, the crisis blew over when Spain yielded. Because of internal weakness, the United States had found itself unready for any venture that might involve hostilities with Britain. But the episode on Vancouver Island revealed the potential danger of Britain's provocative posture in the occupation of the Ohio country. For another time, the Americans might be less restrained and might seek redress by joining Britain's enemies. And now, by 1793, England had entered into the most terrible of all her wars with France, a war which would last off and on for 20 years and which would absorb her every energy in Europe. So Britain's position in North America was becoming weaker while that of the United States was starting to improve. The federal convention that George Washington presided over in 1787 concerned itself with disunity among the states that verged on chaos. To remedy this, the delegates produced a constitution that was greeted with joyous celebration when it was finally adopted after arduous birth pangs. And a triumphant Washington was inaugurated as the first president of a country that now had a stronger central government. The loose federation of bickering states was now becoming a unified nation to be treated with respect. In the summer of 1788, the United States proclaimed a territorial government for the Ohio country. Areas now thinly held could grow and become states. And already early settlers were moving down the Ohio River along the edge of vast lands that would in time become the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. But American authorities had to contend with Indians who were resisting the traditional alcoholic inducements to conclude treaties. For the Indians had heard from their cousins to the east how treaties could be trampled on by the irresistible tide of settlers. So they remained hostile. Early clashes in the Ohio country had seen victory go to the Indians. And now the government sent General Anthony Wayne to settle matters once and for all. A formidable foe faced the American forces, but Wayne studied him carefully, bringing to the task experience gained fighting the Indians in the southern states. When the time came, Wayne engaged large Indian forces in the Battle of Fallen Timbers. It was a decisive victory for the Americans, and the Indian danger seemed to be finally over. The looming menace of the Indian receded, but now the British, rashly installed in a nearby fort, confronted General Wayne. Here the Indians sought refuge after their defeat. Although they were not permitted entry, the very presence of the British infuriated Wayne. The confrontation in the Ohio country between General Wayne and a British commander intent on standing his ground brought Britain and the United States to the brink of war. Britain's tacit support of the Indians was a continuing irritant to the Americans, as was the naval blockade of France, which was hurting American trade. The blockade was part of Britain's war with France, which had been going on since early in 1793. In Congress, Genet's propaganda 
had helped form a strong faction calling for immediate war against Britain. But Washington's administration was for peace as the best way to protect commercial interests. So a special envoy was sent to London to try to settle all outstanding issues. He was an experienced negotiator, John Jay. High on John Jay's agenda were the forts that Britain still occupied in the West. Now, with Wayne's victory, he was able to secure a firm promise that they would soon be evacuated. But to get this, Jay had to make concessions that so angered some Americans that he was burned in effigy. For he had agreed to most of the British rules of blockade and to free access to the fur trade for Canada. For Washington, controversies of this sort led to a warning in his farewell address against future European involvements. President Jefferson, 11 years later, went even further by completely suspending overseas trade. But abuse by both Britain and France continued unabated, with Jefferson caught in the middle, robbed blind by Europeans who were said to get everything they wanted by smuggling and seizing American ships. In France, by Jefferson's time, the government was firmly in Napoleon's hands, and no Western nation would be uninvolved in the consequences of his imperialism. Eventually, he would help push Britain and the United States into conflict again, endangering Canada's very existence. One capital, London, and one nation, England, lay beyond Napoleon's ambitious reach. In London, Britain's sea lords plotted naval strategy against him, and in the House of Commons, members were resolved to spare nothing in the task of spiking Napoleon's grandiose plans of conquest. These were the men that Napoleon Bonaparte was to contemptuously call a nation of shopkeepers but they were determined to oppose to the death the domination of Europe by any one country or leader. And so, as the figure of the man of destiny loomed ever larger on the world scene, Britain's ships and her sailors were relentless in their opposition wherever he went. In battles from the Nile to the Baltic, Britain scored notable victories. And as Napoleon's power spread through Europe, the Royal Navy maintained a constant blockade off the Atlantic coast. And even as Napoleon's star reached its zenith through victory on land, the Battle of Trafalgar forever ruined his hopes of conquering the stubborn British Isles. But the cost of these triumphs at sea was great, for England lost men by the thousands as flames and cannonballs raked the decks of her ships and even more numerous than the losses in action, were desertions by sailors who feared both the carnage and the Navy's inhuman discipline. Deserters from the Royal Navy often found work on American merchant ships, where the British came looking for them. At sea, American vessels were boarded by the British who seized runaway jack tars, and often American sailors as well. The Navy was desperate for crews to fight the French. For the Americans, it was outrageous. So once again, John Bull and Brother Jonathan were at odds, pushing and quarreling in their Atlantic mill pond. In the Ohio country too, Canada's destiny was also involved in events at Fort Greenville. Here, the victorious American general, Anthony Wayne, met with the Indians and persuaded them that his government had come to stay. So the Indians agreed to a treaty, clearing the way to settlement. Then to the south, eight years later, came another American triumph, the purchase of Louisiana from Napoleon, who had acquired it from Spain. <laughs> 
the United States, now free of the British threat in the Northwest and the Spanish threat in the Far West, increased dramatically in size. In ceremonies marking the American takeover of these areas, the Indian and the old-time trapper were forlorn figures who had little to look forward to. Around the campfires, the talk was of settlers coming down the rivers and putting an end to an economy based on furs. But as the ever-advancing line of American forts pushed west, the Indians plotted and attacked. War cries and gunfire echoed from Tennessee to Indiana. In Tecumseh, the Indians had a formidable leader who was determined to stem the American tide. Meetings between him and American leaders led only to greater mutual anger. And at Tippecanoe, Indiana, the two sides fought once again in November 1811. The Americans won a shaky victory. Meanwhile, Canadian trappers working south of the lakes brought reports to British officers like General Brock indicating that Americans were again blaming the British for Indian violence. Men like Henry Clay, congressman from Kentucky, were clamoring for a showdown with Britain. And supporting Clay was a whole nest of war hawks. The hawks, mostly from frontier areas in the south and west, kept up a powerful cry as they called for the unleashing of the thunderbolts of war. Henry Clay, the most strident voice of all, argued there could be no lasting peace in the West until Canada and her rulers were laid low by the god of war. After the congressional elections of 1810, many new Western members joined in the outcry. Over and over from every side came exhortations aimed at an undecided President Madison. On to Canada was the cry of the hawks. Finally, Madison yielded. In exchange for support in the next election, he agreed to war, which was declared in June 1812. The causes of the war, as we have seen, were twofold. First, there was Britain's violation of American sovereignty at sea, and second, there was Britain's support for the Indians. As the war hawks pointed out, the Indian guns at Tippecano had come from Canada, but behind their avowed concern for settlers' rights, some of the war hawks concealed a desire to annex Canada. They were imperialists who believed that it was America's manifest destiny to rule the whole continent. And in this, the Westerners found allies in the Southerners, who wanted to take Florida from Spain. The Americans were supremely confident. Canada, outnumbered 10 to 1, seemed doomed. Victory, said ex-President Jefferson, will be a mere matter of marching. There were less than 5,000 British professional soldiers available to defend Canada. In addition, there were a few awkward squads of militia whose worth was not enhanced by the presence of Americans of uncertain loyalty in their ranks. Many Americans had emigrated to Upper Canada after the Revolution, and they were considered suspect by the fiercely pro-British loyalists. Sir Isaac Brock, military commander in Upper Canada, an ally for Tecumseh, whose Indians had long been dissatisfied with Britain's fluctuating support against the Americans. But now Tecumseh saw that in Brock he had a partner of energy and determination who would back his people in all-out warfare. There was real determination, too, in the Loyalist establishment. They were resolved to fight to the end, to preserve this last chance for a British way of life in North America. As the war got underway, American strategy called for a three-pronged attack on Canada. One force would head north and capture Montreal. 
Meanwhile, attacks from Detroit and Niagara would tie up other British forces. But the key attack on Montreal was postponed because of lack of American troops. And while preparations went on at Niagara, bold British Indian actions took key posts at Michilimackinac and Fort Dearborn. Thus, the opening weeks of the war improved Britain's position. At Dearborn, the Indians massacred the American defenders. Meanwhile, General Brock, with admirable speed, hurried west to lay siege to Detroit, where there was a large American force under General William Hull, a commander who was paralyzed by fear and indecision. General Hull's imagination was tormented by visions of whooping Indian hordes descending on Detroit to torture and massacre women and children. Hull's army was twice the size of the besieging force, but he was so afraid of the Indians that on August 10th, he decided to surrender. The victory of Detroit had removed another threat, and now General Brock hurried back to face the American attack at Niagara. At Queenston, a force of 1,600 Americans crossed the Niagara River and gained a foothold on Canadian soil. For a while, a small British force held them in check, but a large party of Americans managed to climb the cliffs to Queenston Heights. In a British counterattack here, General Brock was killed. The American vanguard held on, but New York militia across the river refused to come to their aid, maintaining they would fight only on home soil. And so the Americans were overwhelmingly defeated. The Niagara invasion threat had ended in confusion and humiliation. To round out a year of fiascos, the Americans mounted an attack on Montreal. But when the New York militia reached the Canadian border, they once again refused to leave their native state. The American leaders may have said that victory would be a mere matter of marching, but they couldn't seem to find the men who would march. The Americans were no more successful in their efforts at subversion, and a manifesto calling on the people of Upper Canada to fight against so-called British oppression fell flat. Thus, the year ended, with Canada still in possession of the vital communications line to the West. Early in 1813, a British attempt was made to win back the Ohio region. The Americans put up stout defenses at Fort Meigs and Fort Stevenson, but the Canadians remained a danger. The new year, however, would see a new factor that would drastically affect Canada's hopes for Western conquest. The new factor was warfare at sea, where the Americans were audaciously challenging the majestic ships of the Royal Navy, the same Navy whose high-handed actions had helped bring on the war. Nothing could challenge a British fleet, but solitary vessels could and did become victims. In many parts of the Atlantic, American cannonballs tore through the timbers of British ships. Though far less numerous, the American warships were brilliantly handled as they attacked. And in the winter of 1813, the Americans captured some 300 British merchantmen as prizes. Although they could not turn the tide of war, victories at sea did wonders for morale. On the Great Lakes, however, this same naval enterprise could change the whole pattern of conflict. Britain had a squadron on the lakes, and the Americans hastily improvised a fleet to challenge it. The battle, when it finally came, would be decisive. On September the 10th, the Battle of Lake Erie began, and it raged furiously for more than three hours. At stake 
was the vital route from Montreal to the west. Six British vessels against 10 American. And when their flagship was riddled, the Americans had to transfer their commander to another ship in mid-battle. But this commander, Oliver Hazard Perry, aged 28, had scored a decisive victory. It had changed the course of the war and virtually sounded the death knell for Canada's ambitions in the Ohio country. Meanwhile, in the West, General Harrison and a well-trained American army had remained on the defensive, awaiting the outcome of the Lake Erie operation. After the victory on the lake, they were ready to move. But the British moved first, abandoning Detroit and retreating toward Niagara. Unfortunately, their commander, General Proctor, had encumbered himself with too much baggage and too many civilian refugees. General Harrison, in swift pursuit, caught up with him at Moravian Town and attacked. The British were overwhelmed. Tecumseh, last of the great Indian leaders, was killed. And with him died the dream of an Indian West allied to Canada. Earlier in the year, Fort George had fallen to the Americans, who had crossed the Niagara River in another invasion. But their attempts to advance further into Upper Canada were checked at Stony Creek, where outnumbered defenders forced the Americans to fall back on Fort George. Now, Montreal became a target once again, with an American force invading Quebec to clash with Canadians at Chateau Gay. Under Colonel de Salaberry, British and French Canadian troops offered the Americans stubborn resistance and forced their retreat. Significantly, this was the first time that French and English had fought side by side in Canada. Soon afterward, there was another thrust toward Montreal, down the St. Lawrence. But at Chrysler's farm, a force of 800 British assailed some 2,000 Americans. Despite superior equipment, the Americans were so badly mauled that they retreated across the river in disorder. With winter coming, the war was over for 1813. Fighting in 1814 opened with an important British naval operation on Lake Ontario. A new invasion of Canada was in the air and success or failure would depend largely on control of the lake. And so in May, a British fleet crossed from York, the capital of Upper Canada, to Oswego in New York State. Landing at Oswego, the British captured or destroyed the large supply of stores that had been accumulated for the summer's operations. Perhaps more important, this show of strength so intimidated the American naval commander at nearby Sackett's Harbor that he lapsed into inactivity, leaving the whole lake open to British movement of men and supplies. But on land, there were new and better American commanders. Once again, the Americans undertook an offensive, again on the Niagara frontier. First, Fort Erie fell, and then on July 5th, the Americans won a solid victory in the important Battle of Chippewa, forcing the British troops to retreat. Two weeks later, at Lundy's Lane, the two sides met again in the war's most bloody battle. The battle ended inconclusively, with heavy losses on both sides. But the British held the field, and the Americans, their navy still inactive, had to pull back to Fort Erie. Here they were soon under siege, just managing to beat off their attackers. Thus, the last of half a dozen invasions of Canada ended in failure. 
Once again, the Americans had shown an unbelievable inability to translate potential strength into effective action. In 1812, lack of cooperation by militia units had reached comic opera proportions. In 1813, General Harrison had led the only potentially successful invasion, but had failed to press his advantage. In 1814, the army was fighting at one end of Lake Ontario while the Navy was nervously inactive at the other. Later that year, the American fleet did secure command of the lake, but it was too late. For once again, great events overseas had affected North America, this time to Britain's advantage. In Paris, at the end of March, British troops were among the Allies who entered the city in triumph. Together, they had won the war in Europe, and Napoleon was on the run. No longer would he tie up the bulk of Britain's army. Now Wellington, its commander, could turn his attention to America. With veteran troops coming from Europe, Britain could attack again, first to capture far-off Prairie du Chien, controlling the upper Mississippi, then in September, to occupy a large part of Maine with an expedition from Halifax. But the principal effort was to be an assault on the American invasion base of Plattsburgh. The armies skirmished near Plattsburgh, but the main action was naval on Lake Champlain. Before attacking the town, the British general decided to await the outcome between the ships. The superior strategy of Captain McDonough, the American commander, won the lake. Unnerved by the resulting threat to their flank, the British retreated tamely to Canada, leaving Plattsburgh in jubilant American hands. Meanwhile, there had been another British initiative to the south, where a powerful expeditionary force had sailed from Bermuda into Chesapeake Bay. After landing, there was a brief battle in which poorly trained American militia fled from a smaller British force. The British then put the torch to much of the city of Washington. It was Britain's revenge for the burning of York in Upper Canada. And as the Capitol, the White House, and other buildings went up in flames, Americans bemoaned their worst military disgrace. But the British triumph was brief. In attempting to capture Baltimore, their commander, General Robert Ross, was killed. His troops suffered severe casualties. And once again, the soldiers looked to their Navy for vital assistance. For 26 hours, the Royal Navy bombarded nearby Fort McHenry with its dreaded new rockets to pave the way for an assault on Baltimore. But the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air were futile. And the event inspired a witness to write the American national anthem. For when dawn came, he rejoiced that the flag was still there. Far to the south, the British prepared another assault. From the West Indies, they headed for New Orleans, where they hoped to close the Mississippi. But sharp-eyed riflemen from Kentucky and Tennessee were waiting for them in strong positions. In close ranks, the hapless British marched into withering fire, led by officers who seemed to have learned little since the Battle of Bunker Hill. Under General Andrew Jackson, the Americans killed or wounded 2,000 British, losing only eight men themselves. For the Americans, it was the greatest victory of the war, and Andrew Jackson became a national hero. But well before New Orleans, President Madison had wanted peace. The whole Atlantic coast was now effectively blockaded by the Royal Navy. And even before the war, hostility between Britain and the United States had led to depression along the New England coast with idle ships and empty docks. Before blockade, there had been embargo, imposed by Washington to deny Britain the benefits of American goods. 
This had led to strong anti-war sentiment in New England, where the merchants could not understand patriotism without profit. The cursed Oh Grab Me, embargo spelled backwards, was a government regulation with teeth that gave Yankee traders the proverbial pain. They had never seen anything wrong with a spot of profitable trade with the British. And even during the war, there was large-scale smuggling from New England ports that helped to supply the redcoats in Canada. It even looked as though old King George III might win back some of his pre-revolutionary subjects. For distraught New England leaders were openly suggesting secession and a separate peace. The whole nation was tired of Mr. Madison's war, as they called it, and so was Mr. Madison. After three long, bloody years, not one foot of Canadian soil was occupied by the United States. Meanwhile, in Maine, at Niagara, and in the West, sizable areas of American territory were occupied by British forces. But if the U.S. could not conquer Canada, neither could Britain conquer the U.S. Plattsburgh, Baltimore, and New Orleans had shown that. It was high time to bring the dreary and inconclusive conflict to an end. By August 1814, negotiations were underway, and to Canada, it seemed that Britain held the advantage. There were renewed hopes of modifications of the border in Canada's favor, especially in the West. British delegates at the peace talks did not fail to press the advantage their victories had given them. The retention of Michilimackinac and part of Maine, plus a strip east of Niagara, would improve Canadian communications. And the old idea of an Indian buffer state came up again. There were even hints of renewed war if the Americans rejected these demands. But again, events overseas swung the balance. In her triumphal entry of Paris after Napoleon's defeat, Britain had had several allies. But at Vienna, where peace was to be made with France, conflicting ambitions among these allies came to light. In the autumn of 1814, the shadow of war fell across the conference table, with Russian bayonets pointing at Poland and Prussian bayonets at Saxony. In time, the threat faded, but it affected Britain's whole posture in America. Dangers in Europe would make it difficult to spare troops for America. So Viscount Castlereagh, Britain's foreign minister, was advised by Wellington to make a quick peace with the United States without annexations. Thus, Britain's conquests were abandoned and the border adjustments were forgotten. Once again, Canada's needs had ranked low on Britain's list of priorities. At the end of December, 1814, peace was signed. A happy outcome for American war hawks like Henry Clay, who were quick to proclaim this failure to lose as a victory. Victory for America, with the eagles screaming joyously in self-congratulation. In the popular mythology of the time, men with dubious claims to heroism had their names emblazoned along with those of the authentically valiant, like Oliver Hazard Perry. Pictures of Perry graced many an American home, as did pictures of Captain Lawrence dying on the deck of his ship. It was more pleasant to dwell on sailor heroes than on incompetent generals like Wilkinson, who were usually at sea on land. But there were critics too, who lampooned the dismal performance of the militia, which had turned the early campaigns into military comedies with many camp followers in the cast. For true patriots, however, there were lush lithographs to commemorate the glories of dying for the young nation. For as the heroes expired on the quarterdeck, the trumpets proclaimed the humbling of a wicked Britannia. The horrors of Indian scalpings approved by the British 
were also remembered by artists of the time, as was the revenge by Colonel Johnson in killing a Tecumseh who was depicted as especially ugly. The burning of Washington continued to burn in American memories, with special loathing reserved for Admiral Coburn, who had himself painted, as he put it, with the flames of Washington warming my backside. And there was vengeance in a massive outpouring of caricature in which wicked John Bull was stung by American wasps and hornets. And a bloody nose was what George III got for squaring off with a nimble Yankee. For other British villains, nasty tonics and a variety of indignities. But despite the bitterness left by the war, the decline of Napoleon Bonaparte had changed the real issues between Britain and the United States. Now headed for exile, Napoleon was no longer the great troublemaker. Soon, death would come to end his exile. But already his fall from power had led to a relaxation of the exhausting demands on the Royal Navy. No longer would British manpower be drained to the extent that Britain would infuriate America by raiding its ships for sailors. But shipyards on the Great Lakes and memories of battles there and on Lake Champlain served to make it clear that naval power in North America was still a potential threat to both sides. In the uneasy atmosphere that followed the war, would this threat still hang over the lakes? A ruinously expensive arms race seemed inevitable as neither side felt it could let the other get ahead. Yet an arms race would increase the very danger it was meant to prevent. Fortunately, rare common sense prevailed and in 1818 the Rush-Bagot Agreement was signed, putting an end to the building of men of war in shipyards in the Great Lakes. At Kingston, Upper Canada, and at Sackets Harbor, New York, Old ships were laid up, and new ones left unfinished. For each side was now permitted only four small, lightly armed vessels for all the lakes. But if there was a relaxation on the water, the forces on land remained on guard, keeping a careful watch at Niagara and other border points. For no one in 1818 thought that another Anglo-American war was unthinkable. The famous unguarded frontier was still a good many years away. But meanwhile, how did Canadians view the War of 1812? Naturally, they saw it from an angle very different from that of the Americans. And even today, ceremonies on the old battlefields proudly recall Upper Canada's resistance to invasion. The stubborn loyalists who stopped the Americans at Chrysler's farm and in other battles a century and a half ago are remembered today for their successful struggle for survival against odds that seemed overwhelming. Also remembered are the nimble voltigeurs who under de Salaberry's leadership helped frustrate a thrust at Montreal. The Battle of Chateau Gay showed that a threat from the South could unite French and English Canadians in a common cause. The famous fight between the Chesapeake and the Shannon was celebrated in song and story, with the Canadians giving due credit to the courage of the defeated Americans. This British victory off Halifax was significant, for the pride it engendered suggested, however tenuously, a potential common cause between the Atlantic colonies and inland Canada. <laughs> 
And so the war produced the first stirrings of Canadian nationalism, although the map left by the treaty gave little to cheer about. With the Ohio and Mississippi now firmly held for American settlement, Canada could forget its fur trading ambitions there. For the United States, the road to Western expansion was unhindered. But Canada could look only to little known lands held by the Hudson's Bay Company, cut off by a thousand miles of wilderness. Canada seemed to face a harshly limited future. Thus ended that strange, dismal, and much misunderstood war of 1812. There was no real satisfaction in it for anyone. And even today, both sides claim to have won it. For the Americans, it had meant a great deal to challenge the arrogance of Britain. And now the West was open to them, and American ships on the high seas were free from harassment. But still, Americans don't invoke the spirit of 1812 as they do the spirit of 76. If they did, too many bumbling generals and stumbling militiamen might come back to haunt them. As for Canadians, they felt their country had survived wanton aggression, and perhaps that was victory enough. But what of the future? It had been shown that once again Canada was the inevitable scapegoat in any Anglo-American conflict. In the event of future hostilities, which were far from impossible, could Canada survive again? Looking ahead, the odds seemed poor. <laughs>